All right, so for this uh, lecture, we're talking about case specific things. I'll try and look, I gotta actually stay by the computer. I love walking around. Um, but we're gonna talk about actual cases that you, you may or not have seen yet. So bronchoscopies, who's done them? Couple, perfect. You see people raising their hands, ask them when it's your day to go to the bronch room, what worked, what didn't work, okay? Um, bronchs are usually for either, hey, uh, what's going on with this person? Something seems a little off. Uh, usually they have cancer, but they could also have like questionable findings where they need to take lymph node like specimens and stuff. Um, so, you know, you're gonna expect that these people aren't gonna have the healthiest lungs. So you're gonna take that in consideration. Again, five cause hypoxemia we're gonna come and play with these patients. Some of these could be pediatrics, A child has swallowed something and went down the wrong tube, it's in their airway, or we think it's in their airway, they don't seem like quite right, they can't talk and tell you what it is and stuff. So they're gonna get a, a fiber optic uh, bronch, or in this case, it would be a rigid bronch. So what do you do? Well, it all depends on first, what type of bronch are you gonna do? That's the most important thing. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing a fiber optic, it's a flexible scope that can go in through either an ET tube, it can go in without anything, or it can go in through an LMA. You just have to figure out what size that scope is, and you have to make sure you have the appropriate tube that can facilitate that going in, or nothing at all. And if you're doing nothing at all, well, what do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna go through what two, what two possible locations can you go through? How do you get to the lungs? Nose or mouth, right? The nose typically is easier and a little less stimulating than the mouth. Why? That's why when we have semi-awake patients, we put in nasal trumpets and not oral airways because they'll gag, right? So you can go through the nose. Which type of anesthetic do you think is harder? Managing someone with no airway or with an airway? There's not really... There's really not an answer to that. It all depends, right? You have to look at each patient and try and identify what their risks are by putting a breathing tube in someone who you might not be able to get it out of because they have poor pulmonary uh, health. And once you take over breathing for them, they really might not be able to be extubatable anytime soon and go home. We can get very sick people to come in for these procedures and we send them right home. So you wanna try and think about that. Who, who are we actually taking care of? How can we best optimize this experience, this procedure, and can we get them back home, right? We don't want to keep them in the hospital. They might get an infection. Uh, we don't want to cause harm to them, you know, by us doing too much, right? I mean, yes, maybe putting a tube in everyone might be the safest thing, but maybe not if we can't get the tube in, or there's complications when we put the tube in. Someone stylets with the glide scope and goes through the trachea. Was it the safest thing? Why didn't you just do it under sedation and, and local. Why don't you just localize the area, uh, the airway, and put the, let the procedurals put it through the nose? Like, what was wrong with that, right? Maybe they're on blood thinners. They didn't stop taking their Plavix until yesterday. So that's no longer on the table. We have to go through an airway. So you can see how this plays out every single day in the preoperative areas. So glyco. Glyco dries your secretions, but how long is it gonna take? Five to 15 minutes, I mean, who knows, right? It's not gonna work right away. So you're gonna give the glyco in pre-op, you're gonna give it right as you're doing the induction. Pre-op probably, right? Like, let's get it working. Glyco is gonna do what for side effects post-operatively? Dry mouth and heart rate could go up. I think of glyco like you're going down a hill and glyco takes your foot off the brake a little bit. So what do you do? Are you gonna typically go a little bit faster, right? But it just depends on how steep that hill is. I think of atropine as like, there's no brakes, right? No brakes at all, and you're on a steep hill. And then I think of like all your beta energic drugs, so really your beta ones, as I'm gonna hit the gas and go down the hill, right? Um, so glycos can be a good drug, but it's not a drug that works fast. So in emergencies with bradycardia, not the best drug. Probably atropine is, maybe ephedrine is helpful, or a little squirt of diluted epinephrine. So glyco is something to consider. We talked about bleeding with platelets. You'll see people do like different things and they might bring someone back under 50,000, but just in the back of your head, no, this isn't probably a good idea, right? You're not the procedurist, but you do have that final say if you feel comfortable giving that anesthesia for that case. Uh, your name will be on 
that case if they, they die. Um, so who do you have to be worried about? Well, a lot of these patients are going to have PFTs. So if their PaO2s are less than 70 or PaCO2s are greater than 45, that just means they're retaining CO2. So it's something's going on in the alveolar capillary membrane. Um, they're probably ventilating fine, but again, there's some disease that's going on. It doesn't take long. You'll be at the, the procedures will be at the top of the bed. You'll be off to the side. Minimal EBL. Head of bed slightly up. They're going to be in your airway. So there's two different types of bronx. 90% or more are going to be the flexible one. It's basically what you do when you do a fiber optic intubation. Anesthesia is going to have their own equipment. It's just theirs are a little bit more fancy. They have a lot of ports and things that they can instrument through it. But it's basically the same thing. You can go and play with that equipment. I, I actually implore you to start messing around with these things on your free time. Your cases get done early. Put your hands on the equipment and operate and stuff. The opportunity to do a fiber optic intubation is not going to come every single week. So don't miss your opportunity because you don't know what you're doing. And I can guarantee you when that day comes to use a fiber optic and you're like looking at this thing upside down like my mom when in the 90s holding the mouse up in the air and trying to get the mouse to move and stuff, you're not going to do the fiber optic. So the equipment is... You're not wasting money on most of the fiber optic stuff unless it's disposable, but then don't get it dirty. Um, I just recommend feeling the, the scopes, turning left and right, up and down, flexing the tip and stuff. It's going to help you be more prepared for when you actually do do the fiber optic. Rigid, again, is going to be a, a straight metal scope. It does not move. If the patient moves, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to perforate, okay? So this is general anesthesia. The scope's so big, you can't put an airway in. So you're going you're gonna to ventilate through the side port. You're either going to do pressure jet ventilation or you're going to do some really crazy things on your, ventil uh, your, uh, ventil your ventilator to be able to try and move some air and stuff. You know, even when you're not moving full tidal volumes with pressure jet ventilation, you are passively moving oxygen and some CO2 kind of in and out and stuff. Um, the other thing is, is that if you're bleeding fiber optics and glide scopes, throw them out. You have a bleeding airway, it's either good old DL at the bedside or it's this rigid bronchoscopy. Uh, it's pretty much your only options. The other thing was with this is it, it says a stable platform, but it, it can actually stent the airway open. If you have a tumor sitting on the, in the interior side of the mediastinum and it could potentially collapse your airway as soon as you take away that muscle tone, you take away muscle tone as soon as you use your SIBO on, let alone you could take away muscle tone from some of our anesthetics. Obviously, most relaxants you take away muscle tone. It's pretty obvious. But you might take away enough muscle tone that that, that little tumor that makes them feel like they can't breathe just collapsed your, your airway and you're screwed because you can't ventilate them. So having someone who's trained with a, a rigid scope is great. You can get that in past the obstruction, and now you can ventilate them. The question is, where's the obstruction, and can you replace the, the, the larger um, rigid scope with an endotracheal tube that can go past it? Now, again, which endotracheal tube do you use? So go into your workrooms and figure out what kind of equipment you have because you want to find one that's rigid, just like a rigid bronchoscope, because that is going to set your airway open as well. So there's a lot of things that you might consider bringing to be prepared to set up your room. So here's a child who I'm just going to guess and say that has a rigid scope in, has no airway, and there's a side port that looks like our anesthesia circuit. What I can't see is how they're ventilating them because they're not obviously using the bag because the anesthesiologist or CRNA is got their elbow on it. So it is kind of hard to see. It's not a video and I can't see the actual ventilator there. So I imagine that they're doing something, some type of like quick, small sort of tidal volumes or something passively there 
Um, I don't see a pressure jet ventilation at all. Um, and that laser thing on their throat, I think is just possibly helping them identify like their location. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to tell. Um, but it's scary, right? Not having an airway, but having an airway, someone else is in your airway. Okay, here's a flexible. That actually looks pretty close to what we would be using in the anesthesia world. What's the minimum tube size? That will probably be a test question. It's size eight. Can you use most LMAs and not even put a tube in? Yeah, some of our LMAs we can actually intubate through. We can just put an LMA in and then eventually mask them, you know, instead of actually putting an oral in, put an LMA in. What's the difference, right? It's probably gonna work better. And then eventually you just kind of stick a tube in. If it goes in smooth without a stylet, you can intubate the person. You know, you're still gonna look for entitled CO2 and stuff. Well, take the tube out and put the scope in. Uh, so we do most of our bronchs with an LMA and the reason for that is why. What's the pros of an LMA to MAC to endotracheal tube? I gotta start getting your names out. So which is more stimulating? Most stimulating to your airway. Reactive airway, who do you not wanna do A, B, or C on? Who's gonna cough more from a tube, MAC, or an LMA? A tube. Who's gonna cough the least? MAC. LMA is somewhere in between. Which one can you consistently ventilate from the most? Perfect. Um, ET tube. ET tube. Then, what comes after? LMA. finding all your names here. Now I can call on you for the quiet ones back there. Okay. Perfect. So here's your size eight. Fire risk. So what are they actually going to do? We don't know always. Sometimes we ask them. This, I always have a conversation with the procedurals for the surgeon beforehand. I don't care who they are if I just dumb a million cases. I'm always going to ask him, what do you need from us? What can we do for you? We facilitate surgeries. We don't do surgeries. If we didn't facilitate, facilitate things, we wouldn't have a job. Like the only things that we could actually earn money on are probably like pain procedures and then, you know, maybe epidurals and OB and stuff and, and blocks. We, we build direct for if it's not done during the case and stuff. Beyond that, we wouldn't have jobs. So we're not, we're sort of reliant on surgeons, but they're also reliant on us too. There's a lot of cases they couldn't do without us. It's a mutual relationship. So show mutual respect. So I talked to them, asked them, what do you need? Uh, will an LMA be fine? If my goal is to do an LMA, I don't necessarily ask them will LMA be fine because they shouldn't dictate the anesthetic because then they start to become the captain of the ship and they, and they own the liability that's involved. But you ask them, what do you need? Do you need muscle relaxant? And they'll say, no, I don't. So an LMA will be fine. They know what LMAs are, but they're dictated if they need muscle relaxant or not. Uh, rigid, you know, is kind of up in the air. Depends what your facility does. Uh, so yeah, you just ask them. Uh, so we do LMAs. We find that they're easier. I've done MAC fiber optics with proceduralists um, and I've been able to do them. It's just a lot more challenging working in enough anesthesia that they don't cough um, and that they can tolerate the fiber optic going through the nose while they're still breathing, but they're asleep, then going between the cords and then maybe lavaging the lungs. Maybe they're taking suction. Usually they're just lavaging and suctioning and they're just doing a quick uh, bronch airway. Something's going on with an ICU patient. Uh, they're usually not doing any type of diagnostic procedure and stuff, but they might cough and so on. So it becomes challenging. So we usually do an LMA. Sometimes they're going to go in and they're going to use some type of uh, laser. So if they're going to do any type of like cautery or anything that's going to cause a fire, you should ask them ahead of time. Like, are you going to be doing any type of like lasering or bobing at all? 
because you want to remember that when they're ready, you need to go down on the FIO too. This is going to definitely be a major lawsuit. Uh, so 30% is the, like the magical number we go below. I'm not sure where they came up with it and stuff, but you better make sure that before they start, your FIO two reads 30%. So you should know how to be able to calculate that on the machine if it doesn't have an adjustment based on FIO2. So like some machines literally just let you adjust the air and adjust the oxygen. But you guys did that with VNS, right? Like how to do the combination of it, perfect. You know, if all else fails, you gotta get the, you gotta get the air or the oxygen down, turn off the oxygen, go up on the air until you see the FIO2 start to read like below 30 and then back down on the air and go up a little bit on the oxygen. Again, you're just trying to stay below 30%. Now, all our machines have a oxygen um, sensor. That sensor needs to be calibrated. There never seems to be really like a protocol on like how often do you calibrate that sensor. So what I'll see sometimes is like a lot of times people, CRNAs, attendings, and students will come in and they'll just, the last part of the checkout for our, our GE machines, which is what Hartford has as well, right? Is basically like the FI2% come down to 21, right? And we kind of always click through that. Well, that's like asking you if the sensor is like picking up on what room air should be. I mean, sometimes it comes down like 17%. You're like, huh, like, wait a minute. Like, if it was 17%, I think I would be dead, right? But we click through it and then the machine just assumes that the starting room FIO2 is 17% when it's not. So then that means that when you're measuring the FIO2, when you're doing the procedures that it has to be under 30, you're probably like several points above 30. Now, does that really matter, guys? Joe Schmo me says, I doubt it, right? I have no evidence. But I'll put a nice $4,000 suit on, and I'm going to come in there with my, my patient that had an airway fire, and I'm going to sit you right up here, and I'm going to ask you, so tell me the steps to doing an official machine check. What happens when it says 7th What are you supposed to do? Why didn't you do that? This is for a jury and your peers, right? You're gonna be like left thinking like, ah, oh, well, you know, we're busy or like, what was the FIO2 at the time of the airway fire? It was 30%, but your machine was reading 17, so our calculations say it would be over, be like 34, or whatever, 33. And you're, what's the, what's this book in Nagel House say? What's the FIO2 supposed to be, right? And you're just gonna be made to look like an idiot. And then they'll find an expert, CRNA or MD that's gonna come in and testify like, I would never do that. And you're fried. You have no leg to stand on. Probably doesn't matter, right? It's like 34, 25, probably doesn't matter, but that's not how the legal system works, right? You're not trying to talk to your fellow CRNAs and MDs like how everyone does it. You're talking to civilians who are gonna be like, well, that's not what you're supposed to do, right? The book said that, your protocol said that, machine, the, and this is the other thing too when it comes to legal stuff. They'll go to the machine manufacturer website and they'll look up what they recommend and they'll fry you on that. Did anyone ever know that most of the LMAs and the manufacturer guidelines, if you look at the inserts, which never come with the LMAs because they're back in the workroom, they get thrown out, actually say you can't put LMAs in people with a BMI over 40? Did you guys know that? Do you think someone's been sued for it for complications? Millions of dollars here in Connecticut, millions. Oh, well, you weren't supposed to have an LMA in that person. That's why they lost their airway. SIBO, bronchodilates. Maybe you really need the bronchodilation. Maybe you don't need it. Maybe you're not gonna get it to the patient because guess what? You're sharing the airway with the proceduralist who's gonna be injecting things, putting fluid down, sucking it out. If you're sucking out stuff out of the airway, where's your gas going? Where are your tidal volumes going? Not back to the machine. The machine's alarming saying that you're not achieving your tidal volumes because the machine's typically reading the tidal volume on the way back, not on the way to the patient and stuff. So it's gonna think the volume of breath wasn't delivered. So your anesthesia is not going to the patient and, and it's not coming back into the circuit, right? And kind of doing that like loop, that closed loop. Your patient's gonna start waking up, right? They're gonna start getting lighter. They're gonna start moving as they're trying to pierce through the lungs to get to a node, the biopsy that they might miss, right? Um, so a lot of people will do TIVA. They'll just say, you know what, let's eliminate SIVO. Uh, the other thing is SIVO is going to cause holes in the environment, ozone, or we have any people that are really big about nature? Only one? <laughs> That's fine. Good for you. Because nature's beautiful. It's all we have. I like being outside. I like going hiking. 
I try to remind myself that like I did see her in high school to be able to afford the opportunities to do more things and then I just went straight to working and teaching and everything else. So I'm working on it. But nature actually gets harmed by our gases. We actually have a major part of uh, contributing to pollution from the hospital systems. Like if you looked at like hospitals around the whole country, anesthesia I think is like 10 to 15% of the culprit in ozone pollution. And it's probably from all our inhalation gases. Nitrous is worse than the inhalation agents, or worse than the uh, um, volatiles, that's what I'm trying to think of. Um, so you're also filling up the room if you were to be running nitrous, which really wouldn't make any sense doing these cases and stuff, uh, it might not be good for people who are pregnant, so think about your colleagues too. All right, so this says you keep the fresh, glow, uh, fresh gas flows higher. Um, so uh, basically what I'm trying to say here is you keep your fresh glass flows, in this case with most of our newer ventilators, higher because the accordion that's kind of pumping the air into people you see the you go you guys all can see the accordion on the machines basically it doesn't refill easily so if you keep your flows higher in between the suctioning or you know they're popping the ports on and off you'll be able to keep the machine ventilating and trying to overcome that loss in tidal volume so what do you think works better for ventilating someone who has a leak because this is a leak they're leaking out of the little shared three-way valve that you have to get sometimes they, they don't provide it so what do you think works better good awesome how do you guys know that yes. vns oh good wow i'm very impressed good okay um why pressure control okay yeah, good job, guys. All right, so pressure control is basically the ventilator is like the ventilator is not that smart, okay? Like you think it's smart. I think this all these new things that go with like these selfish go pros. I don't even understand that stuff. I'd love to learn them, but until we get them, I'm just way over my head. We work with pretty much either pressure delivery or volume delivery, right? And if you break that down, look at how the machine works and stuff, it's just based on when does the machine, when does the machine know to start and finish and how are you gonna deliver the amount of air that you need? So in pressure, and this is flow, this is like your, your flow rate and stuff. Like the ventilator works like a faucet. And instead of thinking of lungs, think of like a, a container a big like tall container of soup right and that's the if you fill it up all the way you fill your lungs up all the way both lungs maybe that's you know like a thousand milliliters it's more than that obviously because you can take your actual like spirometry if you did like your total lung capacity it's more than that but let's think vital capacity and let's just think like a, a thousand milliliters so whether it's pressure or volume you turn the sink on until a certain cutoff point right how do you know when to turn the faucet off if I'm in volume control, I turn it off when it gets up halfway. Because halfway of, yell at me if I ever pull off a permanent marker. Halfway of 1,000 would be 500. So if you're in volume control setting, it's and you say, OK, Mr. Ventilator, I want you to give 10 breaths a minute at 500 milliliter tidal volumes, right? without getting any ratios. So it's going to say, oh, OK, great. Uh, so every how many seconds am I going to get 500 cc's? Six. Every six seconds, right? Because the 10, 60 divided by 10 would be six seconds, right? So every six seconds, the, the faucet's going to open up. And it's going to stay open up. It's going to stay open long enough until 500 cc's is in there. And then the flows are going to shut off. You're going to close the faucet. Pressure. So in that setting, and you have a shared airway, and you had a shared airway where <laughs> I had a little hole, and the water is going to drip, 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 drip out, and not come back to the ventilator. The machine is going to give 500, and it's going to alarm because it is watching on the way back and say, tidal volume is not achieved, right? But it knew. It knew it gave 500. Uh, so that 500 doesn't actually get to where it needs to go, which is where? Where's the real destination that we're trying to send the oxygen to? 
alveolar, alveolar capillary membrane, right? We're going to jump across that little thin layer and get into the blood. It doesn't care. It's just going to keep ventilating that way. Uh, it's cut off is just simply, I gave 500, like, deal with it. So when you have pressure control, so that's your volume control. Now, the other things that are usually on there, too, is you're going to have, like, you'll have heat, and then you'll also have, um, what else am I missing? 10, 12, FiO2. Um, we don't have to worry about that now. You'll also have high ratio. I love talking about high ratio. But... Okay, so when it comes to pressure, pressure is a little bit different. Pressure is going to work more on compliance than we, we would think. So with pressure, what do we set? Rate. Peep, FIO2. Depending on the setting, you might set an IE ratio, but that's usually not part of pressure settings. You, you, you actually set like uh, an inspiratory time. Which then ends up being an IE ratio, but no. So what's the, what's the part I'm missing? Not tidal volumes. It's not pressure support, but it's the same basic thing. Inspiratory pressure. Same thing. Pressure support would be, I'll give this pressure if you trigger my flow sensor or pressure sensor, depending on how you have it on for spontaneous. But when it's mandatory ventilation, it's just your inspiratory uh, pressure. So you set your P, right? So centimeters of water, I set a P of 10. This patient with a pressure of 10 is, let's say, 70 kilos, 20 years old. Patient B right here is 80 years old. They're super kyphotic. And let's say they, they, they work in a coal mine their whole life. So that would be, this is A. And let's say I set a pressure of 10. A, young, 20 year old, B, I'm not gonna say old, but 80 year old. Kyphosis and colons. What's my tile going to be? For A versus B. What can we generalize? High for who? Low for who? Why is that? Compliance, right? What you're asking is, is how much, how hard is it going to be to push the, the diaphragm down, the thoracic cage outwards, and how elastic are the actual lungs, the left and right lungs? We don't know, but we have an idea when we put people on pressure settings, and we then see the sort of passive outcome of giving, let's say the variable is 10 centimeters of water. So for someone who is B, we get a smaller tidal volume. Someone who's A, young and healthy, no comorbidities, we get a much bigger tidal volume. A is more compliant. The, the less pressure, the more volume you get for less pressure, the more compliance you have. Um, so now we go back to the equation where it's like we have a hole in our circuit. Now the container doesn't like illustration-wise work as well when you're talking about pressure because we're kind of assuming we have like a close, we're trying to say we have a closed circuit right here and we're sharing it with like someone with a scope going in and this goes down into your lungs like that. When you don't have uh, a leak, all we have to worry about is how compliant the lungs are, the chest and, and so on, the diaphragm, how they're positioned, age, all that stuff. And, you know, the outcome, the variable in this case would be the tidal volumes. So let's say this is not actually in right now. We got 500 cc tidal volume with a pressure of 10. That's pretty reasonable. It gets better or worse than muscle relaxing. Okay. Usually gets better, right? Uh, this person's like 250. They have half the compliance. Okay, when you have the ventilator on pressure control, it doesn't care. All it cares about is it's gonna deliver enough 
flow until it reaches, ding, 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 the pressure you set. That's all it cares about. So it's going to turn on the faucet, and it's going to leave the faucet on, depending on how long your inspiratory time is, which we're not going to get into. I would love to if we could. I love doing ventilator stuff. It's going to leave it on until you reach that pressure. The pressure was 10. It's going to keep the flows on until you hit that pressure for a set amount of time. And it's just going to turn it off. It doesn't care what your total volume is. If you were getting high volumes of 100, you're screwed. That's basically dead space ventilation. I mean, how much of that's really getting down the, the alveolar capillary membrane? Like, not much, right? And hopefully you're going to notice that the person's becoming hypoxemic. So, in pressure settings, when the machine's turning on, it's going to be having it's going to have a harder time to achieve the pressure of 10 when it's got a hole coming out of the side port. So it's going to try and increase the flows, which means I take a big bucket of water and I try and dump that big bucket of water into this container to fill it up versus I take my little my little Gatorade which one's going to flow faster? How can I get the fluid from here into this bucket faster? Will this work? Or will, if I had this container and I dumped it this way, right? More flows, right? The faster the rate, the larger the volumes. So it's going to automatically adjust. It does it for us because all it cares about is you told it to do a pressure of 10. It's going to have a hard time to get to a pressure of 10. Therefore, it's going to throw more volume. It's going to turn your highway to the lungs from a two lane to a four lane to try and achieve that pressure that you set. So it helps overcome the loss and having a hole in the airway, which is the three-way the three -way port. Does that make sense? Quick question. Um, some, on the vent, there's also, you can do this pressure mode with a volume guarantee, and they like that a lot. Is that, does that override the P and give you the volume? Is that basically what that's doing? It will, it will. It, I, I have to, I've never found an oracle to support that, but my opinion is, is that it will. It's, it's going to, it's going to come up with its, it's going to use the same flow pattern for pressure setting to then achieve a tidal volume. Once it achieves that tidal volume with the flow setting, one of the waves that are more conducive to the pressure setting. So like how, if you ever look at your, your, your pressure or sorry, your flow scalars, you'll see they change depending on what setting you're on. But it's gonna it's gonna be thrown off from my experience, yes, because it's not necessarily concerned about achieving a pressure. You're just telling it to act like a pressure setting, but shut off after the flows have basically filled up the 500. So depending on the person's compliance, it's going to adjust the pressures on its own. It doesn't really care. It will go up with pressure if there if you have decreased compliance, and as long as it gets. 500 cc's. So the question then is, where I'm, I'm hesitant to answer, is is it doing it based on the return volumes? And if the return volumes aren't reaching 500, is it going up on the pressure? I think that's a like a question I can't say for sure, but is it's a good question. You know, you described it, then it won't work to stop the leak. It'll only give the 500 and cut the pressure off. But if it's not getting the 500 back because of the leak then it's going to constantly start adjusting until it overshoots it by giving 700 minus your leak, and then it gets back 500. But all it's really looking at is, did you get the 500? So it's like yes and no, like I'm not sure. Um, I'm putting together a lecture right now for the conference and stuff, and so like I can tell you like there's just really not a lot of articles that are out there on like specific things like that because we just haven't been using it until like the last couple of years. So you can use an LMA, but notice that some of the LMAs have a, it's a good question, have a thing stuck in the middle. So you put the LMA in and you don't cut that tag, you're, you're out of luck. So we have obviously all the things that would go wrong, bleeding, airway issues, uh, VQ mismatching, reactive airways afterwards. So these are some of the things that can help you. You guys can you know, obviously read all this. Should know like what you're, how to screen for a pneumo. Uh, you can obviously cause a pneumo from the instrumentation or also just from the biopsies. Strider's a concern. You know, your question is, is like, you know, it's trying to stop the strider with racemic epi. You can just put normal epi in like a nebulizer. Racemic just is going to have a little bit less of the tachycardia. 
So if you perforate the area air, airway, uh, it, that is an emergency and stuff. Uh, if you have massive bleeding, it's an emergency. So you want to know that there's people that are capable of um, doing thoracotomy. You can open the chest if there was a need to. Pneumos, we, we put in an angiocatheter and then eventually a chest tube if it's manageable that way. We're usually running fluoro in these rooms, so we probably can see a, a growing pneumo. Metastenoscopy. So this is another procedure that's uh, we don't do a lot of, but it's got a lot of risk factors and like board questions. So you can see that they're entering above the trachea, but under a bunch of vessels in and around the area of the heart. Uh, so we can perforate any of those things, right? Um, and they're doing that because those beads that are on there are things that we're trying to biopsy. Those are nodes. We're trying to collect the nodes to see if they have cancer and what kind of cancer it is. We might also be doing it to actually get to cancer. These are some more pictures. These actually show you sort of different ways that they can access the mediastinum. I think the biggest thing is just reminding yourself what's there and actually if we, well, we can't go back because it's recording, but there's also nerves too. So these are the different things that are in the mediastinum. I'll probably have that as a test question. Has different borders. I won't ask that, but like, you know, just spatially think about where everything is. Pericardium is part of that. So you have the heart. So you could have, you could theoretically cause a tension in the um, pericardial sac, which could then cause hemodynamic instability, right? You'll probably see the blood and stuff, you know, if you were to actually pierce the, uh, the heart. Um, these are just some facts there. So absolute contraindications, basically, if you can't see where you're going because you've already been there, if you had radiation, um, if you have uh, abnormal anatomy underlying the mediastinum, that's probably a contraindication because the biggest fear is that you hit a major vessel or you perforate the airway. So anything that increases the risk for doing either of those is probably a contraindication. It looks like radiation is on the relative side, so it's yes or no, but on the absolute side is as it says. Why would you go in and work on an inoperable tumor? If their palliative care makes no sense to put them at high risk. Previous mediastinoscopy, the space is never the same after you've already instrumented it. So the fear is, is that you'd end up um, going through an area that wouldn't be the same way it was the first time. So tumors are actually crazy things. They're going to go and attach to different parts of the mediastinum. And they can also cause those structures to be compressed. So that could be a compression to your trachea, it could be a compression to your SVC, compression to your brachiocephalic, it could be anywhere, it could be on top of the pericardium. So we don't really know how they're going to function, what they're going to do. And as we're instrumenting it in or around them for biopsies, not we, but the procedures, it could potentially um, cause them to bleed. It could cause them to increase the amount of pressure they're placing on it and then for that structure to collapse. We have different approaches. Uh, it depends on where the actual cancer is. So we give anesthesia for all these types of cases. The reason why they usually put the ET tube to the left is they like to go off the right side and get a straight shot in. So the neck's usually moved over and turned and everything. They extend the shoulders just like in direct laryngoscopies because it gives them better access and gets their neck out of the way. Another view of the instrument behind the aortic arch. So what a test question is always about the brachiocephalic. So what do you notice on the brachiocephalic? So you notice, obviously, it's right where the scope is, right? So if I compress the brachiocephalic, what am I? What what comes off the brachiocephalic? How would I know? So one of the biggest things is is your right carotid comes off the brachiocephalic. The brachiocephalic is 
basically your subclavian for your right side of your arm, right? So you have your right carotid that comes off of there. So you better hope that they have redundant circulation through what? Circle willis, right? You better hope that left carotid works well, and you better hope that the what other two vessels in the back? Vertebral arteries are good at what they're doing, right? And the older these people are, the more likely that they're coming to these bronchs. So we're probably thinking like they might not be. So again, okay, that makes sense now, right? We should probably see if people have carotid diseases and stuff. Like that could be another risk factor for not doing the procedure because they've got, yeah, their right's great, but their left's like 70% occluded. it. Well, what risk factor do we do in this case? Well, we can include the right. And, you know, who knows the vertebrals are enough to keep up and you can have a stroke from this. So... The other thing is, is uh, so not only right common car uh, carotid artery, but then the subclavian artery that comes off the brachiocephalic goes to your arm. So if you had an O2 sat on your right arm, if you had an A line on your right arm, it's kind of like two train of th two different ways of thinking. Is you could prophylactically put an A line in the right arm or the left arm. If you cause hemorrhage and they're going to code, it's nice to know their blood pressure if it's in the left arm, because there's a good chance that you hit the subclavian, because then the right arm's not gonna work, because they're hemorrhaging. But, let's say you don't, they don't hemorrhage, but they occlude, how accurate is the stat gonna be if the stat's in the right arm and the arterial line's in the left arm, right? You're like, you're not gonna really see a dampening as well, in my view, as you will with an A-line. Because in the reverse, you have the A-line here, the non-invasive cuff, pressure here you start off seeing how well they compare to each other and then you'll see a drop in the pressure on the a line and not the cuff and that's going to tell you a lot sooner that like you're having problems you'll just see the art line go down and stuff and so then you'd be like hold up you know you're also decreasing the actual blood pressure to the brain so there I, the, the slide i think says left arm but i would take either so first biggest number one problem, brachiocephalic compression. The biggest complication is hemorrhage. Any of the vessels, who cares, hemorrhage. You hit an artery, you're gonna die a lot faster than if you hit a vein, but there's a lot of vessels there. So when you, when you, you, when you talk about preparing for cases, you should try and do everything you can so you're prepared. So in this case, large bore IV is a must, an A-line is a must, having available resources there, like thoracic surgeons or cardiac surgeons to fix it is a must. Uh, maybe you have to crash and put them on um, bypass so you, the blood stops flowing through all that stuff um, and we're just perfusing and oxygenating them through a machine. What's a large bore IV? Yeah, yes. Are you from the ED? No? Okay. Like I, everyone in the ICU is always like 18. I'm like, wrong. People always will put 18s in, but it's not a large bore IV. What law is that? What law dictates more flow through bigger IVs? Pasal's Pasal's law. Yeah. What's the biggest factor in Pasal's law? Yeah. To the what? To the second one. I'm pretty sure it's more. It's like exponential right for flow the and so that's like one part the the the, the bad side of Pascal's law is what that decreases flow turbulence. Well, turbulence yeah turbulence absolutely so like right turn so inside yeah left right turns right uh, depending on the viscosity of your blood that can cont contribute to to turbulence as well uh, so that's why we want to have some reasonable viscosity between blood and crystalloids, albumin, plasma, but length. So the longer the distance I go, the more or less resistance. More resistance. So do I want an 18 gauge brown pour on a triple lumen or an 18 gauge angiocatheter, it's an inch and three quarter in a large, a large vein up here? It's questionable, right? I would probably think this is gonna flow better. I can definitely tell you a 16 or 14 gauge is gonna flow way faster than a brown port on a triple lumen. When you do massive trauma, you do big traumas that come in, 
Are you infusing through the triple lumen or are you infusing through the what? Someone say, well, sheath could be big, yeah. But what is it? What's usually up here at the core? With the, oh, I just said the core. Good. You guys have seen all this. I'm just trying to bring you back to reality and not overthink anesthesia. I try not to oversimplify anesthesia, but I definitely don't want to make it harder than it is and stuff. Uh, cordis, yes. You have this big fat cordis you can blow fluid through. Um, that would be faster than a 14 gauge. But yeah, so a 14 or a 16 gauge, go for it. You know, if the vein curves and kinks, don't go for that one. Go for something a little bit higher. I'm a big fan of uh, ultrasound. So like you can get some big boys in, in the upper arms and stuff. You have your basilic, brachial, cephalic. Cephalics are sometimes decent. They're superficial. You don't have to worry about nerves. Uh, a lot of muscular men and women, you'll see them on their biceps. Um, brachial is usually going to hang out with the brachial artery. Probably want to be pretty good at doing ultrasound that way. And the basilic for most people with normal anatomy, not everyone's the same. Basilic hangs out kind of the most medial, but it's a big, big vein too. And that one's an easy one to go for, um, as long as they're not, it's not too deep and people aren't too big. Perfect. 14 gauges can be used too for new tension pneumos. And we're talking like mass effect, pushing the trachea to the side, compressing the heart. Like they're gonna die, you have to relieve the pressure. So put a 14 gauge in. Oh, so the other thing is, is uh, this you'll just see this over and over again. So just like totally put this in your care plans and really understand some of these concepts like tension pneumos, right? Hemorrhaging, large volume resuscitation, like Pascal's law, like comes in handy like all the time. The other thing is, is uh, venous air embolism. So you're gonna have so many cases where this can happen. This is like on your check sheet for like, this patient's not doing well, like could it be this? Yes or no? So venous air embolism is like one of them. So basically like if you're operating with exposed vessels, the heart's still pumping, arteries are going forward, venous systems bring it back, and you might suck up, right? Uh, if you have enough of a gradient, you might be able, you might actually suck in air, room air. What is room air? What is the percentage of room air? 100% is room air, it's what we breathe. But as Vanessa would say is that the partial pressures are obviously different based on your atmosphere. So, or at sea level, so it's basically the same everywhere at sea level. What's, what's, in, what's in air right now? 21% what? So it gets broken down into 21% of O2 and then what? 70 what? Yep, 78% nitrogen. And then what is this last 1%? Uh -huh. What else? Yep. What else? Mixed gas, maybe mixed gas is sevoforine somewhere out there, night ventures like floating around. Um, so the problem with like ret the problem with sucking in air is that you're sucking in nitrogen, right? Like CO2, who cares? Argon, it's not going to make a big difference. It's the nitrogen that the body has no use for. And so what happens is, and if you ever, any volunteer firefighters here? No. Uh, so one of the biggest problems when you're like in like firefighting is if you cavitate the pump with air. It's the same concept. If you get an airlock in the pump, you don't pump water forward. You get an airlock in the heart, you don't pump blood forward. And then you get this vicious cycle of hemodynamic instability where you have no blood pressure and you will code. Uh, so this can happen anytime that the place that's being worked on is above the heart when you think of dependency. So right now, my heart's here, so anything north, or I guess you'd say anything superior to it would be an area that could cause a venous air embolism, okay? Shoulder surgery in the seated position, craniotomy if you're sitting up, for instance. Um, when you're laying supine for these cases, the top of your chest that they're going into when you saw those pictures, it's probably gonna be above the heart. So it has a high chance for it to actually cause a venous air embolism. Um, so what do you do? First of all, you can figure it out because you might see a significant drop in your end tidal CO2. Because either A, a huge amount of nitrogen's there, and the CO2 doesn't pick up on nitrogen, it only cares about CO2, 
or B, because your blood flow is really not there to send more CO2 to the lungs. So, you know, the machines, you know, the corgan's going up and down, it's ventilating the patient, but you don't have really much of a cardiac output with really much CO2 to ventilate out. So your CO2 drops, you become unstable. So a precordial Doppler is actually like uh, pretty helpful. You know, it's like, where do you find one? I would, you know, if you, if you have them, and I've thought about this, like we should just start using them so that when you have the high risk patients, you just know where they are and you use them. But basically you're looking at putting a Doppler on either the left or right parasternal side of the, the chest, somewhere I think around like two to six, I wanna say. Um, and you're, you're listening for like what type of murmur? Yeah, yeah, perfect. And then what do you do? So you immediately tell them to flush the field with water. If the venous system sucks up water, like who really cares? But air is a problem. And then you probably wanna put the patient in a T-bird position. And sometimes some say to go in the left lateral. There's a chance as they're super unstable that you might be able to suck the air out if you have a central line in. In some cases, you might put a central line in because the risk for venous air is so high you've already got a tool that can possibly pull out the air. And so you would be pulling out air with like a big gate of a large IV like um, syringe, and then you're giving it right back to the patient. And hopefully eventually that catheter and that air goes on the right side of the heart and it, it, you can capture it and suck it all out or to the point where that pump starts to effectively circulate blood again. So airways are a big concern is what's gonna happen when we put these people to sleep. You can have a complete airway obstruction if they are given muscle relaxants, or just even when you turn on the sebo fluorine, they get relaxed enough. So these patients are probably done best by being spontaneous, just like the pediatric patients. Like if they keep breathing when you put them to sleep by mask induction, or by being judicious with your propofol, your ketamine, your fentanyl, your versatile, like whichever way you want to do it and stuff, you keep them breathing. They'll stay breathing, which means they're going to be using their normal thoracic muscles or diaphragm to pull the lung open, right? Versus it relying on positive pressure. It's negative pressure keeping, sending the airways open. If, and so when you talk to these patients, you're gonna ask them like, how do they do in different positions? When they lay flat, can they not breathe? Like might be a problem or are you gonna lay them flat, right? Maybe that's enough of a concern that they have enough of an obstruction that they're not going to go to sleep. It's going to be a fiber optic awake intubation because we're that concerned that a little bit of anesthesia is too much. So you talk to them, you just chat with them, ask them how they do sitting versus supine. How do they sleep at night? Check their PFTs. Um, the type of obstruction is the type of mass that they most likely have. This is definitely a test question. So if you Obstructing during inspiration, it's an extrathoracic. If you're obstructing during expiration, it's an intrathoracic mass. You can see like these obstructions on your flow volume loops. We talked about the paralysis. We talked about bronchial smooth off the relaxation with general anesthesia. So mask induction meaning spontaneous or just plain old localize the nerves in the uh, mouth and the airway and you know get the breathing tube in and then when the breathing tube, tube is in then start to turn on your gas and put the patient to sleep. I would still keep them spontaneous. The, the concern would be is that you keep them spontaneous, then you go into DL and put the tube in, and then like they're a difficult airway, something else happens. Like it's not as easy as you think. You're trying to put the tube in and you can't, and now they're like getting light, and now you gave them more, and now they have struck, and they're not spontaneous. So it's kind of like the fiber optic awakes are limiting some of the problems of just getting the tube in. And then once the tube in, you get them like asleep still spontaneous because they can still obstruct. Because if the obstruction is distal to where the tube goes, you're gonna have problems. Um, if they fully obstruct, what do you do? So one is reverse them, right? Like whatever you gave, see if there's a reversal. Is there a reversal of propofol? You'd be a millionaire if there is. Is there a reversal to anxiolytics that are benzos? 
Yes. So you should know what the reversals are. How about narcotics? Yes. Um, SIBO fluorine? No. What do they have to do to wake up from SIBO? They have to ventilate, right? Um, so just keep that in mind. What can the surgeon do? What was the first thing we talked about? Two types of bronx. Rigid bronx. Stent open the airway. Maybe it's right there over the crina. They can stent it open so we can actually at least get some uh, jet ventilation in there. Or you can just crash them and put them on bypass, which I've never seen, but could happen. SVC compression could be an issue. So, so SVC compression is an issue because what drains into the SVC? Everything from your arms. Where are all your IVs usually? In the arms, right? So you might see venous engorgement. They could have very flushed faces, edema in their faces. These are all these things you're assessing them for. Where do you put the IV in those patients if you have that issue? The IV. Yeah. The foot. The leg, put a femoral line in. A uh, really good IV or good a great access point for pediatric anesthesia where we go all the time is maybe in the saphenous vein. Um, it's a good landmark. You look for a medium malleolus and then you the saphenous vein kind of hugs around it and stuff, and you can follow it all the way up the leg and stuff. So that's a great spot to go for. If you don't see anything, you can put it under an ultrasound. Oh, and with SVC engorgement, you're going to have increased uh, ICPs because you can't drain the brain from your uh, jugulars, right? So they're at risk for increased ICPs, right? If you make it worse, then the ICPs go up even more. So if you have a high ICP pressure, what do you do? You think you're going to tolerate blood pressures like 90 over 50? No, you need cranial perfusion, right? You have to overcome the ICPs. So you have to add to that blood pressure even higher than normal because you have higher ICPs and stuff. It's just like when you're in the neural ICU. We talked about the venous air embolism, so this slide's just talking more about it. Oh, sweet mode. Uh, I turned it on last night. I'll show a picture in a second. Uh, sweet mode is basically you, you, you slow down the CO2. So the CO2 is still picking up whatever your number is, 40, 50. But instead of seeing like the CO2, so just look for sweet mode on your monitor because you learn how to do this. But instead of seeing like this, like, you know, eight a minute, it condenses everything where it just shows you a trend. Trends tell you what's going on. In the minute by minute, you know, biosynthesis, you don't know when it's gone. So here you see this. What happens is you see lines. And then you see the lines start to downtrend. As people start to take up venous air, you'll see this downtrend that's not explained by changes in blood pressure until too late and stuff so it's nice to see those trends uh recurrent laryngeal nerve injury that they hang out right around the aortic arch so and they kind of loop i think underneath it and over it um so you potentially could damage that when you when the surgeon places the scope what does the recurrent laryngeal nerve do what does it go and innervate your, your vocal cords right So you could have airway closure. Uh, One-sided injury won't close your airway probably, but it'll make you have a hoarse voice. Uh, you'll see unilateral you know, movement of the vocal cords if you DL them afterwards or look at it. Um, if you were to somehow hit both, you're in a lot of trouble. So if someone already has a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, you probably might not want to do this type of procedure because if you hit the other one, then they're, they're going to lose your airway. You guys want to take a quick... Uh, Five minute break. some snacks.
is basically in that whole general area with the whole media steinum. So you're around blood vessels, you're around the heart. We've kind of already talked about that. There's different kinds of approaches. Um, one of the biggest reasons why we do thymectomies is uh, myasthenia gravis. This is always board questions. There's lots of questions we can take from MG. So that's what we're going to talk about. Basically, the hallmark signs are going to be weakness. Um, and the weakness gets better with rest. So that could be a, that could be a question on the test. Um, the weakness in this case is generally more central um, and proximal. There can also be visual problems with muscles. This is all muscle related. And then oropharyngeal involvement, which would mean aspiration risk. Okay, surgical implications. You guys can read it. 
Uh, you worry about the obstructions, all the things we talked about before. I'm just making sure I haven't missed anything. So specific things that bias and gravis is, okay, well, what do you do to treat that? Well, first of all, what's actually going on? You guys know what's going on physiology-wise with bias and gravis? What's actually, what's the problem? Molecularly. Autoimmune to the neuromuscular junction and to what receptor? Acetylcholine, nicotinic receptors, right? So what do they do when you have a half-working acetylcholine receptor? You need acetylcholine receptors to be able to move your skeletal muscles. That's why you're weak. All voluntary movement goes through acetylcholine receptors, also known as acet uh, nicotinic receptors. What is the agonist that binds to it? What's the neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine. That was an easy answer, right? So all these things can be answers on a test. Um, when I give a muscle relaxant, like rocaronium, where does it bind to? Okay, you see, this is all related. What subunit on the acetylcholine receptor? Alpha, alpha subunits. How many alpha subunits? Do you have to bind to both the activator or turn it off? Yeah. So you have to have a lot of rocaronium to outcompete the acetylcholine, right? And whoever wins the tug of war decides whether or not the muscles move. So if I had to treat somebody, and let's now get rid of rocaronium, but we relate it back to clinically, and uh, I'm treating someone who has profound proximal core type muscle weakness, and the you know, condition gets worse, what do you think they need more of? Acetylcholine, because the receptor sucks. It's not really working that well. It's not that efficient. It doesn't respond well. So maybe if we overstimulate with more acetylcholine, what drug do we give to outcompete muscle relaxants? Which works how? Exactly. This becomes sort of like the chain of communication. The chain of communication eventually gets broken down. It's not the most efficient system, but what we do with these patients is we give them pyridostigmine, which is another acetylcholine restorase inhibitor. And we just hope that we give enough of it that when you have those massive vesicles dumping 10,000 plus more molecules of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction, we hope that enough of it gets across to the other side where the acetylcholine is, and the muscles work when we ask them to work. Uh, we hope. As the disease progresses, we need more and more of the drug. So a surrogate to understanding the disease pathology, the, pro the progression of the disease, is going to be how much pyridostigmine you're on. When you have flare-ups of autoimmune diseases, what are the other drugs that they give people all the time? It doesn't matter what it is. Steroids. Fight the immune system, make it weaker, right? Maybe it doesn't harm you as much. And then the other thing with these patients is plasmapheresis, where you can take out the antibodies themselves. So you should ask them, you know, have you had PFTs and stuff? How uh, far along is your disease prognosis or disease progression? We can stage them with these classifications. I would not, if I had a test question, you would have the graph because you're never going to remember this. So I would say, based on these, what category are they? And the answer would be right there. It'd be like an easy question to get on the test. Um, so don't memorize that. Just know that, that it exists and that you should figure out what it means so that you can have an assessment of how much risk is involved with this type of patient. So the bottom graph, I do want you to remember the likelihood of ventilation, which means I intubate you or whatever, and we're probably not gonna be able to take you off the ventilator because you just don't have enough effort. If you do plasmapheresis or they've had recent plasmapheresis, unfortunately, it also decreases plasma cholinesterase, which is different than acetylcholinesterase. So what would be affected by plasma cholinesterase deficiencies? Yep. And so you might have a prolonged effect of sucks. If you're getting tons of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, you'll have tons of acetylcholine elsewhere, so you might go into cholinergic crisis. You hold pyridostigmine on the day of surgery. 
And uh, definitely test questions is like what to do with non-depolarizing and depolarizing agents. So the answer is don't give anything. You really don't need anything. Consider everyone with a myosin and gravis as being like slightly muscle relaxed to begin with. Be like that person has 20 of uh, rock aronium on. And they have, a, they have four twitches, but you know that the fourth twitch is not what percentage of the first twitch. 90. You guys know what that means? You understand what that means? It's like physically the same height as the first switch. That's all that means. It confused me when I was in school. I couldn't understand why. So what does that tell you? How much recovery of the neuromuscular junctions are there? What percentage would you say could still be muscle relaxed despite having, you know, let's say it's not 90, but let's say it's less than 90. You have four twitches, there's fade. What does that tell you? you probably have 70% or more of your neuromuscular junctions blocked. It's crazy to think of, right? Like, how's that possible? How are you, how are they breathing? They're breathing on the ventilator. The surgeon's complaining and they have four twitches, but, but there's fade and that means 70% of them is blocked. And what that means is, well, that's a good thing because your body's really good at not dying and stuff. You know, it's pretty hard. It wants to survive. It wants to finish that race, whatever it is. It, it wants to outrun the tiger, right? even when it's gotten a huge bite mark out of its leg. Uh, so it's hard to like block the neuromuscular junction and prevent muscle movement, um, but still 70% is a big difference with someone who's already got no reserve. So think of these people as having that kind of like, oh, they have four twitches, but they could still have a ton of muscle weakness. So when you crack open the cebo fluorine, we don't really know how it works, but cebo fluorine does cause a little bit of muscle relaxation. That might be all you need for these patients and stuff. Uh, so just avoid it. These drugs would increase the blockade of neuromuscular drugs any of the non depolarizers anyways. So same thing, you know, we give mag to vasodilate people. Like this all kind of makes sense. I, some of the things I wouldn't remember is like iodine contrast agents. You know, that's that's a strange one. I don't think all diuretics do, but some do. Avoid mechanical ventilation if you can. If you're gonna reverse someone, you probably want to use what type of uh, non-depolarizers and why? Good. Awesome. That's a great answer. That's used in your brains, guys. And you guys have been doing this the whole class. Everyone's giving great answers and stuff. I like that. You're thinking beyond the, we use this always. That's just what they use. It's like, okay, if I have to reverse someone who's already got a ton of pyridostigmine circling in their system, they stop the day of surgery, uh, do I really want to reverse it with more acetylcholinesterase blockers, right? Do I want to give neostigmine? Because I might cause what in the PACU? cholinergic crisis, right? Which is emergency. Too much acetylcholine. So in this case, like tenuous patients just give sugaminex. Doesn't even work the same way. Sugaminex so looks at the amino steroids, which are rocaronium, becaronium, and pancaronium, and it binds to it or encapsulates it and stuff. Yeah. Plus or minus, do we give them to pediatrics? Do we give them to people in renal failure? I, it's like the whole medical legal, what do we really do versus what you should do? I mean, I gave neostigmine to like a 22 month old like three days ago, and I, or sorry, Sugamidex, and it was like, I just didn't want to give anything. Like we try not to give these kids muscle relaxants, but it was like, it's specific things we're doing. And, but you know, that's something you have to think about. Read articles, see what everyone else is doing. Europe has a lot less lawsuits than we do so they try a lot of things and then we're like yeah that's a good idea you've done it for 10 years let's try it like sugamid x um oh so when they're asleep oh so for when you're waking them up wide awake none of this like half asleep half awake because tenuous airways and swallowing is a voluntary thing so they might be already weak with their swallowing reflexes so you want to make sure that they don't ask rate because you didn't wake them up all the way and then you wake them up all the way and you still gotta look at it and be like, should I pull this too? Before you wake them up, optimize their ventilatory status. More specifically, optimize their ventilation perfusion mismatching. So sit them up. If you're 45 years old and you're laying flat, you're developing anaphylaxis. If you're 60 years old and you're just breathing at tidal volumes and you're sitting, 
you're developing elastasis, which means you're messing with the ratio of ventilation and perfusion and stuff. Uh, now you have this disease, you're definitely have elastasis, you're taking huge biocapacity breaths, and you probably laid them flat, and they're under positive pressure ventilation, and whatever else that they have in their comorbidities, they're not optimized. How do we optimize people? I mean, it's simple. Sit them up, give them the appropriate tidal volumes for their um, ideal body weight. Positive uh, pressure is terrible, but it's your only choice when you're ventilating people. So add PEEP, the right amount of PEEP, and then do recruitment exercises. What's the recruitment exercise? Valsalva. What is it? Valsalva. Yeah, like a Valsalva. So you turn the pop off, 30 to 40 centimeters of water, turn your flows up, close your pop off to that number, watch the actual real time dynamic gauge, hold the bag, and then kind of adjust how hard you squeeze it to kind of keep that pressure within the you know 30 to 40 for 10 to 15 seconds. The new machines also have a vital capacity breath, which is actually the same thing. And so you would just hit the button, program what you want it to hold at for how long. So, you know, 30 centimeters of water, 10 seconds, and then release, and then it will release back to PEEP uh, in your, your normal like settings on your ventilator and stuff. You know, the longer you sleep, the more you're developing the VQ mismatching. So you can actually do that throughout the whole case. Every time you pop your circuit off, you lose your PEEP. And for those of you that were working in the ICUs during COVID and stuff, People don't do well when the, when the ventilator is disconnected when you're on 20 a peep, right? Um, so it's the same philosophy. Like you disconnect a peep and they go through this vicious cycle of um, atelectasis of like the alveoli collapsing and reopening, collapsing and reopening. And, those, and it's not supposed to ever collapse, so that causes localized inflammation. They'll stay in the pack longer. Oh, they they look good, but keep them there. This is where I'll usually put an order in for them to be seen by either a CRNA or anesthesiology before they're allowed to discharge home. We're putting in our own, or, our own orders and stuff. Any questions with MG and then thymectomies in general? There could be like tumor related. There's too much thymus. You take it out, you know, but like MG is the one where we'll see most of the questions. And then like some of the risks and stuff are very similar to like, you know, doing the scopes with the uh, um, the mediastinoscopy scopes because you're in the maybe something. Anything? Okay. So uh, tricks, and you'll have uh, MG patients that come in for other surgeries, right? We're not going into this crazy area, but like you'll just have someone that has MG, and you're like, what do I do? Um, okay, tricks. We do tons and tons of tricks. So uh, tricks is actually, you know, it's a good one to know. I've had emergencies during tricks, and so it's a good learning experience because. I can teach you based on what I've seen. Uh, so a trach can be for all sorts of reasons. A lot of times ICU patient can't get off the ventilator for two weeks, you bring them in, they get trached, and everything, you know, they can, obviously, why does a trach work better than a tube? Sal's law. Why? Less dead space. Yeah, shorter, less dead space. You go straight to the lungs. So it's easier to ventilate through. Um, it also is a less risk for having infections, right? Okay, so this is basically what they do. Uh, the trach is is a more permanent airway in emergencies, but the easiest thing to do in emergencies is to do a cricothyrotomy. Put a crike in, get, get an airway, and then you can do a safe trach afterwards. ENT surgeons can just come in and slash trach someone. You know, they're, that's what they do when they do, they do the same thing for the cases when it's under a control setting. So they'll just come in, slash trach someone. Will you always have an ENT specialist two, two doors down in the OR? No. The problem we see in anesthesia is that people don't act quick enough. They all take their turns trying to intubate the same patient, you know, and it doesn't work. So it's like at a certain point when you're experienced and stuff, if you can't intubate and let's say your partner can't intubate, that's it. What's the next thing on the algorithm for that's out there from the ASA? LMA, right? You try and wake them up, but like, let's say you can't wake them up. You can't ventilate them, you can't put a tube in, they are ventilating. If you can't ventilate, you can't oxygenate. Throw an LMA in, maybe that's gonna fix it. It's a blind thing to do, but it's worth trying. I'm not gonna lie, it's worth trying. That doesn't work. What do you do? You do something. You literally do something. And so the question is, is at what point do you slash crike them? That's the question. What do you need to crike someone? And people die because people don't crike people. Plain and simple. 
or they do and it's too late or someone gets the tube in finally they someone jams the tube in somehow blindly you could do a blind digital uh, intubation maybe someone comes with fiber optic but this is time time is oxygenation is uh, hypoxemia right so you need to know in the back of your head would you be prepared to slash crack someone so what do you need to crack someone a scalpel and what what size like a 6-0 and maybe a bougie so that you can get the bougie in and know that you can feel the cartilaginous rings of the trachea that are on the anterior portion of the trachea and then slide the ET tube over it. That's it. All right, so cricoid thyroidomy is in the cricothyroid membrane, which is the little dot. The big thing, which is a little bit below, is where you do the trachea. Trachea is usually between the second and sixth tracheal rings. Not that I know of. <laughs> I'm not trying to do that. Okay, so these are some of your risks. Um, so, you know, look, you get a trach. You could have tracheal stenosis from the trach or from the ET tube. Uh, tracheomalacia is another problem, too, where the tissues can get soft and close actually, like, distal to the um, tubes. That happens with trachs as well. You, you might also be doing these during emergencies where, like, there's vocal cord tumors. I've done these where you have to do an awake trach, and you just have to give them enough little sedation, but not a lot because they need to breathe. And then they'll localize the airway and then they'll go in and they'll put a trach in while they're wide awake because you're, you're just not going to get a tube through a massive tumor like you'll get people who don't see a primary care people and they come in with massive tumors in their vocal cords and you run the cat scan they're like <gasps> you know this isn't breathing it finally got worse enough or maybe some bacteria got in there and it finally closed enough that they can't breathe and they're like i have to go to the emergency room they haven't seen anybody in like five years and you're like you know, luckily, usually it's not so, so cute. You can get them the CAT scan. You look at CAT scan and you see like this like massive, and I've had these patients, you see like this massive mass and, and then the actual area that is like open is like right here. That's it. And that's while they're awake with no relaxation to those muscles. Do you think you're getting a tube? And you can measure that too, that you'll be able to just put a cursor on it and measure it. You can't get a tube in there. So it's an awake trick. You bypass it. You just can't lose their airway. Uh, so you got to be very, you got to be thoughtful on what drugs you use. So you know, maybe a little for a sad, but should you use fentanyl? Fentanyl's pretty strong when it comes to apnea, right? It can be pretty strong as far as sedation goes. But Versed can be too. Do you do a little ketamine? Maybe. It, it, I've done them all, but like you just got to get comfortable with these drugs. So the more you use them in like non-critical cases and you start to see like what 20 ketamine does to your propofol induction, what like eight of Versed does versus two, what 20 mics of fentanyl does with Versed with ketamine, and you start to see how that works. It's like, it's like chicken sexers. This is a story that Dr. Jackson talked about in uh, neurobiology. They can't tell you how they know the chick is either a male or female, but they just know. And you're like, well, how do you learn? And the only way to learn is with a person who's already certified to sex the chickens. So you just sit with them and they're like, which one is it? And you'll say female, they'll say no. And you throw it in the male one and you say female, no, throw in the male one. And eventually, subconsciously, your brain develops these subroutines that somehow figures out what it is. And I swear to God, it's just like anesthesia. like. You just start to figure out and get a feel for it on how to give this stuff. The people who don't do well with this, the people who never use the drugs. I don't ever use ketamine. I don't use nitrous. Presidex is terrible. It's not enough analgesia. And you're like, oh my God, like good luck. You know, like not everything's gonna be perfect with just propofol, just versed, just fentanyl. Learn them all, become intimate with them. Same thing was done with uh, World War II spotters and aircraft before they had, obviously, whatever they have now. Um, they would have radar and they'd look at the planes and like far away they would know if they were German or they were allied you know, over on the English channels. And so what they would do is they would have people come out with them and you have to be constantly around the clock spotting for these planes because it's the difference between sounding the alarm and people going to their bomb shelters and surviving and getting up some type of fighter to be able to defend the homeland of England. Okay, so in these cases, you can read the slides. I'm just gonna step through it from my memory. Uh, patients come in, they're usually sick, they're from the ICU and stuff. They're, well, they're not that sick. They're at the point where they're probably stable, actually. Um, so you just find out basically, are they on high FIO2, any problems, all that. 
they have ET2s, make sure you see what the ET2s, assume the ET2s probably are like junky, they have things in it, they've been in for a long time. So make sure your tube's secured, you put them on the ventilator. I usually just turn them on a little bit of gas. You don't need to knock these people. These people are coming out of the ICU probably, right? So probably your tenuous blood pressure is respiratory status. Put them on a little bit of gas. And once they're like kind of sleepy, I tell this to people too, if you ever precept with me, there's three things that you focus on anesthesia that are like the most important things and the rest you can figure out later. So when you're getting pushed around, you know, where's your temperature probe? And like, you know, like people are like, basically you're not going as fast as I'm going. You're like, uh, like I've been doing this for like a couple weeks here, you know, right? Just like take a deep breath. Imagine punching the person in the face. No, don't do that. Take a deep breath and think like if you ever feel out of your comfort zone because you're being pressured or just because the case is crazy, am I ventilating? Am I hemodynamically stable? And do I have a reasonable amount of anesthesia on board for what we're doing in this moment? Because most people will think about all the little things. Those are the three big things. So if you are coming in the room and you're putting a patient on, a, on, a, on the circuit, you're gonna put them on a little bit of gas. They just need enough anesthesia to tolerate the tube. They came down on whatever they came down on, which might've been nothing. They were breathing with the tube with nothing on a lot of times. So do you need to crank your gas up, make your patient unstable, and then have to deal with the hemodynamic instability? No, put them on enough to tolerate the tube for amnesia, right? Now when they start operating, you need more. Hemodynamic stability is simple. Watch your entitled CO2, watch your blood pressure, watch your heart rate. CO2 is real time. Every breath gives you an idea of what their blood pressures are because CO2 is the outcome of good cardiac output and aerobic metabolism. So you can see CO2 changes faster than you can see that blood pressure cuff cycle and tell you their blood pressure is low. You get a drop in the CO2, you probably have a drop in the blood pressure. You'll see it a lot after induction. You'll, have, you'll be ventilating them and then all of a sudden the CO2 drop by 10 points. Heart rate depending if they're on beta blockers or calcium blockers, usually goes up when their blood pressures drop. And then ventilation wise, I always am looking, when things are crazy and I've been super busy putting an A-line or putting in lines and I'm looking over, I'm like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, I got gas, it's pretty reasonable for what we're doing right now. I see entile CO2, that's reasonable. So the blood pressure is probably reasonable, but it is, I looked. And at the same time though, I know that that entile CO2 says I'm ventilating. And I just make sure the ventilator has reasonable tidal volumes, reasonable minute ventilation, right? So I kind of look at all those things like, okay, I'm good, we're good. We can do all the ancillary things. So a patient comes to the room, put them on a little bit of gas. I usually then paralyze them and make life easy and stuff as long as they don't think they remember anything. And then I wait to give stuff until we're ready to start because again, they're tenuous situations with their bodies. Um, they come in, uh, I'm gonna be prepared. So I'm gonna take them off those anchor fasts. They are not helpful. They'll jam you up when you're ready to start moving things. So I kind of take them off of that and I figure out if it's gonna come off and then I put it back together and tighten it. But I wanna make sure I can untighten it and pull the tube out when I'm ready. I have suction, I'm gonna suction their tube. I'm gonna suction out their gas or tubes. I'm probably gonna pull their gas or tube out because it's usually in their mouth at that point. So I'm gonna pull their gas or tube out uh, and make sure the contents of the stomach are fully emptied and stuff, um, especially before you lay them flat. Um, I'm gonna have them on whatever 5-2 is reasonable, 50-60%. And then once everyone's ready to go and stuff, uh, I usually give them a new gooseneck, a clean gooseneck. It's not sterile because they're gonna, hand, they're gonna have you hand it to them, so it's not gonna be sterile. You're gonna put your tube in over the side of the, the drapes eventually, so it's not gonna be sterile, but you try and keep things clean. So I'll have a gooseneck ready for them. And I'll have a 10 cc syringe ready to take the cuff down. I'll also probably give a 10 cc syringe to the field so they can put the trait cuff up when they're ready. Um, then they begin the surgery. They start cutting down the neck as you're doing your thing, keeping them comfortable. Maybe you worked in a little bit of fentanyl. They'll probably maybe localize too before, who knows. It's usually not emergent. Um, as you're working your way down, that's when you start thinking about turning your FiO2. So as they get down to the layers close to the trachea, that's the time to turn the FiO2 down. So probably better once they start, you go down your FiO2. And even better yet, you might want to think about going down your FiO2 before they start to see if the patient tolerates a lower FiO2 because these are the patients that might have diffusion problems, right? Might have really bad DQ mismatching. So now my FiO2 is down below 30. Uh, at that point, as they get down to the lowest layer to the trachea and stuff, um, and they start to pop through, they're gonna want you to pull your tube back at some point because what they're worried about is they're worried about popping through and popping your cuff. Ah, it's happened. They've gone through and they've popped the cuff and you're like, okay, like, and they'll tell you, they're gonna verbalize, okay, like be ready to pull the tube back, drop the cuff, pull the tube back. 
don't pull the two back. Just pull the, the two back a little bit. They're watching through their hole where your tube is. If they see the tube, you're still in the trachea at some point. Maybe you're at the, the tip is right at the vocal cords. Maybe it's a little passive, but they can see your tube. So you just listen to what they're saying. And if they say, pull your tube back, and you say, okay, I'm coming back a centimeter more. Okay, I'm coming back a centimeter more. And hopefully they're using real words, like, yeah, one more centimeter, not like more. Not real communicates well. At that point, what they'll do is, is they'll start to work on getting in the introducer, uh, the operator into there, and getting everything the whole perfectly formed to put the trach in and stuff. You shouldn't pull the tube out completely until you've hooked your circuit up to the trachea, to the new trach, and you've been able to successfully ventilate the patient. Um, so with the time that that happened, they're like, no problem, like they cut my tube and stuff, they're having problems, and they're like, okay, well, like, why don't we just give you a second to ventilate the patient? Patient was obviously like a lot of comorbidities. And I'm like, they said they cut the tube and stuff, and I couldn't ventilate even with the cuff not being up. I was hoping maybe I could ventilate and stuff like that. And uh, patients started desatting. So like, don't worry, we'll just put the trach in fast. And the surgeon took over from the resident, threw the trach in, threw my circuit over, like, no problem. Put the balloon up, ventilate, 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 high peak pressures, couldn't ventilate. What do you think happened? No. So, but what do you think? What's one of the complications of this? So we go to the next slide. What do you think? Oh, it's on the next slide. What are the complications? False passage, right? You're not in. No entile CO2. And this is stressful. The stats are coming down. You're like, bag, bag, bag. No compliance. All these things are like, this is common, right? No, no compliance, high peak pressures, no entitled CO2 when you're in like the interstitial spaces and stuff. Um, so I'm like, I can't ventilate. I was like, I got nothing. But I'm also thinking like bronchospasm, right? Laryngospasm is the cord closed, but we bypass that. We're below the cords. We're like in the trachea. The only thing that can also be blocking the ventilation is all these little bronchioles that are these smaller airways that are like, you know, off those main stems, all these smaller airways that have tons of muscle on those, you know, people with uh, respiratory diseases, those could close and you can't ventilate and you can't get entitled CO2. You got to keep that in mind. That's an emergency too. How would you treat that? Ooh, this will be a test question. What, what, why, why those? What receptor? B2, you are having a massive bronchospasm. So think of those bronchioles as being like jack, like weightlifters, CrossFit lifers. And like, as soon as you see them right there, they're like, what, you want me to beach ball in? And their muscles are huge. And so it just closes the airway. Um, it's an emergency. They really will close the airway. You will get entirely you get high beat pressures. You'll like, be like, what's wrong? I think I'm in. And this is usually when the people are like, you, you goosed it. And like this happened to me too as a student. I'm like, I don't think so, but I'm I don't know now. Like I'm nervous. And I tooted the bird. This is a different patient. I tooted him again. And I'm like, it's still not entitled. I'm like I swear I saw it. And they're like, you're you're messing around. Like stop joking. I'm like, no. Like I like, I don't know why it's not. And I'm like, and then I said, I the guy has asthma. I think he's bronchospasm. They're like no. Like get the glide scope. And so then like I'm like. I'm like, and the guy didn't desat, luckily. I can't remember what we gave him, but like, uh, I think we could mask him. And like, I'm like, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure like it's Bronco's so Like, why don't we try albuterol? Like, glide scope. So I glide scope the patient. We see the cords. I put the tube in, and um, I think there's a sequence. And basically, like, can't ventilate like, the person. And so then they have me pull the tube again. And then they activate the patient with the glide scope. And at that point, I grabbed the albuterol. I was like, let's try this. And I just shot the albuterol down the tube. It was a bronchospasm. Multiple people have these stories. You're going to have more, a couple people have these yourself. You'll see this at some point in your career. Um, anyway, so I didn't think that that's what was it. It was a false passage. They pull the trach out, they check the hole, they jam the trach back in, and um, I can't ventilate nothing. Now they're desatting. Uh, I grab the glide scope. I'm like, I'm just going to put the tube back in. What I did wrong in this situation was I pulled the tube out that had the broken cuff, and I glide scoped and put a new tube in. But you can't assume you're always going to get the airway. That tube was actually still there. What I should have done was threw a bougie through the tube, pulled the tube out, and put a new tube over the bougie. Because the surgeon would have seen the bougie in the trachea and been like, yeah, it's there. He could hold it for you as you throw another tube over it. That would have been the right thing. Luckily, I had a glass in the room, and luckily, 
I could intubate them. Or I might have used a, I might have actually used a DL blade. I can't remember now. I called for help. I called overhead for anesthesia staff because we were desatting and not ventilating. It all worked out, but I learned that you know what? Like, hey, it's much more simple than that. Um, post op, we all the stuff in your nose and all those what are those things called in your nose that cause nosebleeds when you put the nasal airways in wrong. Terminates those folds help humidify things so you don't have air going through there anymore. So you got to humidify the oxygen going through the trachea. Uh, just so you know, this is like my head, my nose. Do I go in like this at 45 degrees or do I go in at 90 degrees for the nasal? 90. I'm going to slap your hand if you go in this way. That's where the turbinates are and those are what bleed. If you cut your nose off, it's just a hole that's just like right there. And that's how you get the tube in. So it's 90 degrees. Okay, so yeah, uh, we can also do laser mass ablation. This is another procedure. We actually will do these sometimes like like they'll just pull the tube out. <laughs> so they'll be like DLing at the bedside and like this is a quick procedure. They'll just, the surgeon will just take, these are ENT surgeons. Whenever we ENT surgeon around, they can trike every once. So I always feel like a lot better. They do two cavalier, but I'm like ENT surgeon, like you can trike the person. They'll pull the tube out, shoot the laser beam at the cancer on the cords and stuff. And then they'll put the tube back and be like, okay, you can ventilate right now. So these cases, just think about like what you have. Remember, when the tube's out, the tube could be blowing air where they're lasering and stuff. So you not only want the FI tube low, but you also want to shut your flows off when they're lasering if they take the tube out or whatever's going on, because that's still like an acetylene blowtorch, even with less than 30, if there's still oxygen in there, right? I mean, just be careful. Another thing that they can do is, is okay, you leave the tube in and they're going to laser around your tube. So you want a, a tube that's going to resist uh, fire. Um, and then you might also want to put methylene blue in your cuff with saline because then you'll see blue in the airway because the, the, the cuff actually got ruptured. And you won't see it, but the surgeon, she's in there looking directly with their like big DL scope. And it's super stimulating when they have that scope in too. Imagine DLing for the whole case. Like it's really, and they crank this thing up and they lock it into place. So these are good cases for like Remy fentanyl because it's like super stimulation and then it's done. They're painful after, but they're not like as stimulating as when they're doing it. So Remy's a great drug. If there is a fire, uh, any airway fire risk, you should always have a bottle of saline around so you can douse the airway if it does catch on fire. Maybe this is a good case to do Decadron. There's some contraindications. There's not, some people say Decadron is not good for cancer because you're fighting with the immune system and stuff. But if it's swelling is the most eminent threat to the patient, then you might give Decadron for airway swelling. Uh, nitrous supports combustion. That might be a test question. So don't be like, well, we're on only 30% of oxygen and I have 40% of nitrous. And then how much air is going in then if that's the case? So it's the difference, right? Like it would be whatever the difference is in nitrogen being 40%, uh, oxygen being like 30%. So that leaves you with like 70% is the remaining air nitrogen and all that stuff. Basically, air has some oxygen in there, so you probably already accounted for the oxygen in like the equation, but F, your FI2 is not 30%. Nitrous can burn too. So you should know the difference between YAG lasers and CO2 lasers. You can read all that. Know the steps for dealing with an airway fire. It's always good to get it back breathing afterwards. This is regardless of air fire, just after the procedure, they're gonna have very reactive airways. So in these cases, I'll actually turn down my Remy fentanyl to like a really sub-therapeutic dose, like 0.05, let's say. Usually run Remy at like 0.1 to like 0.2. We used to go to 0.7, but like there's hyperalgesic effects with this. So you don't wanna do that. It means pretty much like everything hurts and nothing works with pain meds afterwards. But I've turned my Remy down to 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and try and get them back breathing on the narcotic, on the Remy, to get them to wake up with a nice smooth wake up where they're not coughing and bucking and stuff. It's easier said than done. 
you can th consider giving like a, a half a milligram to a cc or to half a milligram to one milligram per kilogram bolus of lidocaine to smooth the emergence and stuff that's also done it's not done as much anymore but that's something i'll do still i wouldn't excavate them deep or semi-deep or whatever the weird in between is just like tonsils they go in they burn tonsils and they come back bleeding 24 hours later the same thing can happen with these two so uh, do you glide scope a bleeding airway? No, you, you should have the glide scope, but you should also be prepared to DL them um, because it's like in pulmonary edema actually shows up as like a white screen on the glide scope. We had this guy that came in like every year, several times, uh, fused neck, difficult airway. And it was after they tried multiple times, they call us staff from the OR, like the ED doctor call us staff to intubate the guy. Like we'd come out, it's like, I've been to two of the same guy. And like the second time I was just, I knew, I didn't know, but once I saw a guy, I was like, it's like the same guy. And um, ED docs there, they've had all shit everywhere. And you got one doc that's got like the cripe kit, right? They cripe the guy, and they're like, okay, you try it out. And so, like, basically, like, what? The first time I went, I didn't know if I was going on. I was like, maybe these are like, I don't know, like, I'll somehow get a better view, put the glide scope in quickly to look didn't see anything and then my go-to is always a bougie so just bougie where you think the air is and that's what worked and stuff and the second time I went I wasn't the first one there and the doc that got there just put it all day in and they we ventilate with the LMA so we're we're good figure it out you know go back with the fiber optic um, so we've got so glide scope doesn't always work just went to a pack you for esophageal bleed blood just pouring out of the airway um so in those cases again this is stuff i just did one like two nights ago or three nights ago two nights ago monday night um i wasn't there for the bleeding part i came for the access part but anyways guy was bleeding and stuff like that they had already had the tube in but these things happen so in the case in the pack he was excavated and then bleeding so you always have two tubes person's bleeding, go in, glide scope's a terrible idea, go in and DL, have your face protection on, and basically throw your tube in. If the tube pours out blood, it's in the esophagus. If you can see sputtering of blood, it's probably the airway blowing out air in between the blood coming out of the esophageal bleed. So try and put your tube in there. But if you do put the tube in goose it, because you can't see anything, leave the tube in because that's a conduit for the blood to come out of the esophagus and now you know where the esophagus is go back in you know that above the esophagus or interior esophagus is your trachea so then throw your tube into the trachea you'll probably get a tube in that way or your bush or whatever else chest wall resections um, can take lots of time because you know how far does the tumor go into the chest wall and does it affect the pleura does it affect any nearby objects and stuff and when you're doing like chest wall resections, you'll probably need a double lumen tube or um, one of the uh, blockers. You'll have like a, a either a uni blocker or a, that's a name of a brand, but basically you'll have these like these these hard stylets that go down and have a balloon on it, and you can occlude the part of the lung that's going to be operated on. But we'll have a one lung ventilation lecture that talks all about that. So we don't need to worry about double lumen tubes right now. Emergences is like anytime you're doing stuff, you always want to be assessing for hemos. 